the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide the equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall deal delicious. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat. And the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra. And the weaning child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. And the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for all peoples. Of him shall the nations inquire. And his resting place. And John 14 says this, it says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for this time together, and as we can come and worship, and um, just have this moment where we reflect on your perfect peace, God, your shalom. And I just pray that in this, this world of chaos where circumstances seem uncertain or there are hearts that are troubled coming here this morning, God, I just pray that this word shalom, your perfect peace, would rest on the hearts and the minds of our congregation here this morning, God. And not only that, but that as we would um, settle into our service, as we would leave today, as we would go about our week, that not only would we, we would bear your peace, God, but we would be peacemakers, that we would see those opportunities in our day-to-day -day life where we can bring about your peace, God, that we can bring that to this world of, that is confused and, and hurting, God, that we would be bearers of your peace. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, before you grab a seat, could you turn to someone next to you and greet them this morning? Welcome, church. We are so glad to see your faces here this morning, and we believe that the Holy Spirit is here and that he has a word and a message for you this morning. Um, I just have a few announcements that I want to um, get out this morning, and so as Carissa mentioned, our choir is happening, and it is not too late to sign up. So if you're interested in the choir, they meet on Thursday evenings. Um, Carissa is at the back and she would love to uh, get you signed up for that. So make sure that you meet with her if that's something you're interested in. Uh, we also have our kids' night out happening on December 14th. So not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday. And that is for children ages in kindergarten to up to grade 6, from 6.30 to 8.30. Um, and so make sure that you are connecting with um, students at nrchurch.ca if you have any questions about that and that you get your child signed up on our website, nrchurch.ca. Um, we have our Christmas Eve services that are, our Christmas services that are coming up um, soon. And so on Christmas Eve, we have a five o'clock family oriented service and then a seven o'clock candlelight service. If you are looking for an opportunity to invite people to church, this is a great opportunity to do so. Um, we are really excited and are preparing for this service. And then that will be followed by our Christmas service, 10 a.m. here on Christmas Day. Um, finally, I want to bring your attention to Alpha. Alpha is happening on starting on January 12th. It's going to be Thursday evenings running from 6.30 to 8.30. 
Um, we are really excited. We've had our training sessions that have happened, um, and our leaders are prepared and excited to fill the tables with people who are ready to come and ask questions about their faith and to dive a little bit deeper into what it means to be a follower of Jesus. So if this is something you yourself are interested in or you know someone that you really feel should be coming out to Alpha, the registration link is on our website, nrchurch.ca slash alpha. Um, and that registration is live until the beginning of January. So you want to make sure that you check that out. Um, and if you're looking for ways to get involved in that, you are welcome to talk to myself or Matt Connor. Um, and we'd love to give you some more information about it. Um, at this time, I'm going to welcome up Matt. Um, and he's going to give us our word this morning. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, if you're in grades 5 to 7 or 8 to 12, you guys can have your service. Well, it's service... I hate him. <laughs> That's going to go right there. I recently watched a, uh, a little, if any of you know Daryl Johnson, I'm a big fan. Uh, he's a pastor in... Uh, in Vancouver, and I recently watched the thing. Uh, this kind of was just talking about preaching, kind of how to do all this and everything. And so I, I've got a little bit different uh, look today. But he said at the very start, he's like, take as long as you want to get up there because they are all waiting for you. And so uh, here we go. Take a little deep breath. Well, good morning. Um, really excited you're here. Uh, for those of you who are just joining us kind of for the first time or maybe it's been a while, uh, we're, we're jumping into the book of Romans, uh, which is perhaps one of the greatest pieces of literature ever written. Uh, it was written by a na man named Paul, um, who previously went by the name of Saul. Um, he was kind of a, a, a religious person of the law, a Pharisee, studied the law well, uh, and then had a radical transformation um, with Jesus. And, and genuinely, that is my prayer for us today. Uh, despite whether this is kind of your 30th year in the faith, or is this your first week in the faith, or may maybe you don't even know who this Jesus is, uh, I pray that today would be a radical transformation, because that's what we're called to do, right? As it says in Romans, be transformed by the renewal of our minds, and that's what we're continually asked to be renewed, and so I, I, I hope, and this is my prayer, is as we study into uh, kind of Romans 13 today, that we'll have this kind of opportunity to uh, really unpack what Jesus has for us. Okay, because what, what he has for you may be very, very different from the person next to you. And I've kind of been in, in, in soaked in this, uh, this chapter for a while now, but I, I don't necessarily know if, if that's what God has for you in it. And so um, we're going to spend a lot of time in kind of different areas. I want to give you a little roadmap for where we're going to go, because I tend to, you know, I'm a teacher, so I talk lots. Uh, and so we're going to start off kind of by actually recapping a little bit about what David talked about last week in Romans 12. Um, because what we look at the structure of Romans, uh, 12 and 13 actually coincide really together. They go really well together. So I want to give a little bit of perspective of what that looks like. And then we're going to start to talk about uh, the way we relate to other people, the way we relate to other things in our worlds, uh, specifically how we relate to government, how we relate to uh, the law, and then how we relate to the coming day of Jesus. Okay, these three kind of difficult, weird areas, it, it's, it's, it's been a journey, but we're, we're going to get there together, okay? You guys are you with me, church? Beautiful. All right. Uh, so I want to make sure that we, we kind of get a, a good, broad picture of what this looks like. So I'm going to do something. Uh, some of you may cringe at this. I'm going to read the whole chapter. So stick with me. If you need to grab an extra coffee, I'm okay if you need to go get some extra caffeine. But we're reading the whole chapter through to get a big picture of what is being said here by Paul in three different parts, and then we'll unpack each part. Sounds okay? Beautiful. All right, so we're going to join me as we uh, start in Romans 13, 1. It says this. Let everyone be subject to governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against authorities, rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves, for rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath, and bring punishment to the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but as a matter of conscience. This is why you pay your taxes. 
for the authority of God's servants who are given through their full time of governing. Give it to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever command there may be can all be summed up in this one. Love your neighbors yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is fulfillment of the law. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake from their slumber because our salvation is nearer than we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of the darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not carousing in drunkenness, not in sexual immorality, in debauchery, or in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves in Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Lord, ah, uh, May you just guide our time today. We welcome in the Holy Spirit, and we just, we put aside all of our presumptions, all of our ideologies, everything that, that we carry on our own, and we just lay it at your feet right now. May you radically transform the way that we view you, the way that we view each other, and may we just come uh, with a new message from you today, Lord. We are expecting, we are waiting, we love you. We give you all the glory in your precious name. All the people said, amen. amen. Wonderful. So I'm not sure uh, at what point it happened, but I'm sure at some point in reading that chapter, uh, you maybe would have shuddered a little bit, okay? Maybe it was a little, a little tense, a little uncomfortable. It might have happened when he said the big S word, which is submit, you know? Maybe it was when he talked about putting aside the deeds of darkness. Maybe it was when Paul asked to pay those dreaded taxes. But regardless of what part was uncomfortable. God, Paul is going in and having hard facts about what Christian living looks like. But in order to see that, we need to kind of take a step back a little bit. You see, Paul is writing to the Roman church, which is an established church, okay, but is, is essentially divided. Okay? There are two sanctions, this non-Jewish community and this Jewish community who had, had been at odds for a while. And so Paul writes this letter as his clearest example of the gospel. That is why it's one of the greatest pieces of literature. This is perhaps, outside of Jesus, the clearest picture of the gospel we can get. And so he does this kind of a three-part saga through the first 11 chapters. In chapters 1 through 4, he beautifully describes God's righteousness. He describes God's ultimate love and faithfulness to those who love him while reminding us of his ultimate sovereignty and authority. In chapters 5 through 8, he clearly artic articulates our justification through faith and had transferred this new realm of righteousness through the blood of Jesus Christ. And then to finish off the saga, he goes through 9 through 11 saying how Israel has the fulfillment, sorry, how, reminding the Jews of the fulfillment of God's promise to Israel. And that's the gospel, this eternal divide that was created through Adam that can never be restored on our own merit, but a covenant that was broken by our own doing and yet fulfilled by Christ coming down and laying down his life as a spotless lamb to fulfill that broken covenant so that we can have a restored relationship with God. It is a beautiful, beautiful story. But what we see is in chapter 12, there's about this shift. Okay, We, we go from describing this beautiful gospel to saying, okay, now what? What is going to happen? And it starts right in Romans 12, 1. If you want to join me there, it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy— to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You see, uh, this verse is pivotal in response to the gospel that we just heard for the first 11 chapters. How are we supposed to live differently in light of this unimaginable mercy, this in view of God's mercy? Because he came down, fulfilled his own covenant, out of mercy for us that we did not deserve, we need to become radically transformed, not just in our actions, but in our hearts. Our lives are no longer our own, but a living sacrifice to the one who we serve. And so now I realize this is not very pastoral to get your central ideas from a text that was preached on last week, um, but fortunately I'm not a pastor, so it's, I'm, I'm going to say it's okay. But our central idea is actually coming from Romans 12.1, in light of Romans 13, which we'll get to. And this, it's, the main idea is this. Our submission to others is a form of worship to our God. 
our submission to others is a form of worship to God. And this is not a radically new concept, okay? In fact, it's just a, a rewording of what we read just in Romans 12. One, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And this makes sense when in relationship to God, right? Okay, we understand his authority, his, his sovereignty over everything, but we struggle with it when dealing with others, right? Whether it's uh, that, that boss, that spouse, that family member, we struggle with it. There's this idea of submission that we, we just aren't a fan of. But Paul addresses in these chapters of 12 and 13 by describing six different Christian relationships and how we could, you know, relate to them after this heart transformation of the gospel. Now, David last week talked about the three of these relationships with the body of Christ, others outside the faith, and to our enemies. But this week, we're, we're tackling three more difficult ones of government, law, and the coming day. And so let, let's start off with everybody's favorite, the government, okay? Let's jump right into Romans 13:1. Let everyone be subject to authorities, for there is no authority except which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Now, when I first read this verse, if you're like me, uh, your mind always comes to, but what about, and fill in the blank. And so I, I, I want to pause for a second and say, well, instead of just saying, okay, well, what does the text not say, let's Stop jumping to the worst case scenarios and focus on what Paul is talking to. We, we may think Paul is, you know, uh, speaking with a Roman authority over his shoulder, kind of like forcing his pen to write this. And no, actually, that's not true. He was writing to a people in Rome who were under the rule of, or the rule of Nero. And while the rule, uh, the rule of Nero turned very, very sour, and he was one of the greatest persecutors of the, hum of the church, at this particular moment in time, it was actually rather stable. You see, Christians were under the uh, kind of area of Judaism and kind of get, got certain special favors at a particular time. But Paul knew the church was, had a history of revolution due to their new life in Christ. And there was increasing tension due to the increase of taxes. Um, shocker there. And uh, Paul reminds us that Christians, despite our new life, are still under the rule of governing authorities. This is a false up sentence. No ifs, ands, or buts. Let everyone be subject to the governing authority. And the word to be subject here in the original Greek is the word hypotasso, which means to recognize they stand in hierarchy to others. And this is not the first time that Paul has used this word, and it definitely won't be the last. He's used this word all throughout his letters in terms of different relationships and different contexts. He asks us to be in submission in our marriages. He has to be in submission to our employers, submission to our parents, submission to elders, submission to spiritual leaders, and even submission to each other in the body of Christ. Now, the word submission has an immediate turnoff for some people because we have this idea and the connotation that it means someone is less than. But that is not the way that God views submission. I believe that it is our own pride that often gets in the way of what true submission could look like. You see, God has created hierarchies that often bring order into a chaos world. And regardless of where you go, you're going to run into hierarchies in life. Right? Can you imagine a company where everyone there was acting and had the responsibility of the CEO? Like, that would be insane. That would be crazy. Nothing would ever get done. Everybody would just be ordering coffees all the time. Okay? It would be chaos. God likes order. In fact, we see back in Genesis, the world was shapeless and formless, and he went and brought order into chaos. Our universe, by its own very laws, is trying to reach chaos, and yet God, because he loves us so much, says, this is what is best for my people. Order. And so our human issue with submission is that we think that submission means worth less. It is a sign of weakness. And in fact, our biblical view is actually opposite. It is a sign of strength. It is a sign of saying, I'm going to take a spot and a place of humility before someone else. I'm going to humble myself, remove my pride, and serve those who have authority. And the best example we see this, I'm so glad we're singing about Jesus today, the best example we see is Jesus. It's not even close. Right? We see Jesus on the eve of his crucifixion. He knows he is being led to death, and he is serving, washing the feet of his disciples. We see him when he is being arrested, not for any of his own wrongdoing. He could have fought. Peter wanted to fight, but he instead submitted, say, take me, do what you have to do. He submitted in the garden to his father. He said, Father, please take this burden from me. I do not want it. If there is any other way, please Take it from me. And yet he submitted. And if the God of 
the Son of God can make us to submit. I sure need to submit in my own life. Now, Paul didn't give any exceptions here because he wanted people to submit to the authority of the current government, bottom line. And part of the reason he does this is because he had a greater mission, a greater vision. You see, he wanted the gospel to spread to every corner of the earth. He knew there was something bigger at stake, and anything that might interfere with that needs to be minimized. Any distraction needs to be eliminated. And Paul's saying this, who cares about your taxes when you have an eternal mindset, when you have a kingdom focus? Why bother petitioning to the emperor when we instead could be sharing the good news of Jesus Christ? You see, Paul realized he was called to something greater, a higher purpose than debating the political issues. And this is that radical transformation that needs to take place because of the gospel. This mindset shift from things that are here on the earth to an eternal kingdom mindset shift. This can be a major problem for our society today. We are so stuck in our mindset of given rights that we often lose focus of the bigger picture. And sometimes this means submitting to things we may not like. I'll be honest, I don't like driving the speed limit. I think it's not very fun. It'd be way more fun if we didn't have it. But I realized if I was driving 200 kilometers down the road, I might have got my car impounded and might not have been able to be here with you today and share the gospel with you. It's a silly example, I know. But sometimes we need to submit to things we don't like so that we can share the news of the gospel. We are so privileged to be able to live in a country where we are free to practice our own religion and free to preach the good news to who anyone who will listen. We need to thank God every single day for this. And yes, sometimes it means even following rules you might not agree with. And now I know some of you are screaming in your minds, well, but what happens when the government says something that isn't good? And I, I want to preface this by saying, this is dangerous territory we get into. Okay? I'll be, when I first started looking at scripture, it, it terrified me because I'm like, I, I don't know how to handle this. Okay? And, and as soon as we start to become the judge of what is good, uh, we start to become like Adam and Eve who they wanted to taste the apple for themselves and they wanted to decide what was good and was not good. Now fortunately we have a rock to stand on which is the word of God, but it is dangerous territory. Now Paul never does give us exceptions in this text, but the more we read and look at Paul's life, we do understand that the submission to government and authority must always be measured first and foremost to the authority to the one true God. He is our foundation, and we need to call to him first and foremost. Uh, Douglas Moo, a, a commentator on this, um, I think described this really well. He says, when applied to rulers, submit means to recognize a hierarchy exists and that we stand under the rulers of that hierarchy. Normally, therefore, submission to authorities means that we obey what they say. In all Paul's hierarchical structures, however, the uppermost authority, not all, not, though not always mentioned, is God. He stands on top of ha all hierarchies. And what this means is that we must always submit to those over us in light of our ultimate submission to God. In certain cases, this might mean that we will need to disobey authority immediately over us in order to obey our ultimate authority. Now, this is a dangerous quote, and I want to highlight the words certain cases and might. This is not the status quo. We are called to submit to our governments, but we submit first and foremost to our God. An example of, of Paul showing this as life is when he's pe preaching with Silas to the church of Philippi. Where he's going around Philippi, preaching the gospel, casting out demons, and the authorities seize them under next to no context and throw them in prison. And if you know the story well, you know that Paul and Silas went and they spent the entire night singing praises to God. The entire over and over saying, thank you, God, thank you. For they knew the word of Jesus. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom, Matthew 5.10. And what we see is that there was a sudden earthquake that happened in this prison. And the shackles came flying off. The, the doors opened to the prison. And, and actually we see the jailer all of a sudden comes and sees this open door and, and, and wants to kill himself because he knows that there's no way I will ever survive if, if prisoners escaped. But the most beautiful part of this story actually is what we see, the reaction of Paul and Silas. What do they do? When they had all authority to run, they said, thank you, God, you let us free. They could run out of the prison. They, they, could, they could leave at the expense of the jailer. But no, what do they do? They stay in the prison. They say, no, 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 we're, we're still here. And the jailer says, why? Why are you here? 
wh wh what authority do you have? How can I know what you know? How can I have this peace? You see, when they had all authority to intentionally disobey the government, uh, the government in the name of Jesus, they chose to still submit. They still continually choose to submit. They did not arrest or resist arrest when falsely imprisoned. They didn't run for the hills when the door flung open. Instead, they submitted to authority while still being obedient to God, and God used them through it. Can you imagine seeing miracles happening and then still choosing to submit to what is around you? This is what biblical submission looks like. It's not easy. I can't imagine how tempting it was for Paul and Silas to want to run out of that prison. They said, no, no, no. I, I, I know I'm here for a reason. And God is going to use this despite. And, and this isn't the only picture of faithfulness we see from God. You see, we see the same story with Meshach, Radshach, and Abednego uh, it, when they bowed down to um, King. Ne Sorry, I'm having the, the bunny song in my mind all of a sudden. Like, <laughs> like Alex is singing this, the bunny, the bunny. Yeah, it's, it's Veggie Tales. Go, go watch it. It's okay. Oh, man. I can't, yeah. Okay. Uh, they, stood, <laughs> they stood in the face of adversity. They, they were asked to bow down, and yet instead they said, no, we need to stand for our God, okay? And God was faithful through the fire. We see this same thing with Daniel when he's thrown the lion den. We see the same thing when David is chased down by the current king, Saul. God is faithful, regardless through the trials and the tribulations. And the one thing that we do see happen continually throughout this is that there's usually punishment through the not submitting to government authority. Yes, it is right, but there is usually punishment. And so that is why we need to be so unbelievably careful when we step out in defense of the gospel. We need to have the word of God so deeply implemented into our hearts. There is no mistaking discerning the will of God in the situation. One of the biggest dangers we could ever face is using scripture to further our own agenda instead of submitting to the will of God. Paul will talk a lot more of this in, in Romans 16, and I'm excited to see this. But I want to move on to the question, okay, we're supposed to submit to government authorities. Why? Okay, well, well, you don't have to go much further into Romans 13, 1, for he repeats it twice. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Paul repeats this twice for emphasis, so you better listen up. God is sovereign over every situation. He is he creator of the universe. He has the planets and the stars in his hands. And we are foolish to think that he doesn't have the same power over the rulers. Okay. He has powers over everything. And Jesus even understood this best when he was facing crucifixion, standing before Pilate in John 19, 11, he says this, Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. You see, when we are submitting ourselves to authority, we're really submitting ourselves to God. He placed them there. He gave them power they have to wield over the subject. And yes, sometimes this means that those who are not as favorably looked upon uh, in government are placed there by God. And Paul may be thinking, he's saying this out of ignorance, that peaceful government um, but he's not. Nero, he knows that Nero is going to come persecute the church. And he's still saying we need to submit. He has been placed there under authority of God. And I know this is difficult to understand. And I ask my question, well, why is that happening? Why do we allow that? And, and to be honest, I, I, I don't know. Okay? I'd be foolish to say that this is why God has done this. God doesn't clarify why sometimes bad leaders do bad things. But what I do know is that God will use those situations continually, time and time again. We see through even the book of Judges, false leaders who are brought to power, evil, evil people, that God uses them and continually draws his people back closer to him. In fact, sometimes we can see God's faithfulness and, and his, his mercy in times of poor leadership rather than good leadership. And it's not only the b bad leader. I'm just, I just, I don't like using the word bad leaders because everybody is different. But it's not only the bad leaders that fall short. David, one of the most holy and anointed people, he was chosen from a young age. Okay, he often looks as one of the greatest heroes of the Bible, still had a moment of weakness in which he continually disappointed. He murdered amongst his own people. 
I don't know about you, but he would be nowadays immediately removed. And yet God put him there for a purpose. And it does not mean we condone the actions of certain people. We do not condone the evil and hatred in this world. But we have to respect the authority that God has placed there. Paul states that submission often looks different for different people too. In verse 7, he says this, Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Your form of submission may look radically different from somebody else's. We are called to speak highly of those who are in authority, who are in charge of us. We're asked to pray for them. That's why you will never hear at Northridge anyone ever speak badly about our government because we believe that God has placed them in authority. We need to submit to governing authorities as a form of worship to our God. Okay, that was a long bit. We're going to the second part of this text. We're now going to look at what does God's or what does Paul say about our Christian relationships with the law? Now, the law was repeatedly talked about through the entire book of Romans. Okay, we are is well known by the people of Israel. And this is known as the Torah at this time. It was God's holy law that was given by Moses for the people of Israel so they could live in right relationship with God. This law was well known and habitually studied by all. But this is not only suggestions for a guiding way of life for the Jewish to please their God, but it, it, was, it was about the, trying to attain this unattainable debt that had been carried because of their sinful nature. You see, Paul comes in and mentions debt again in a different light. We go back to Romans 7, in which we are released from eternal debt of the law because of the sacrifice on the cross. You see, when, when the first sin was committed, we are born into sin. There is nothing that we can possibly do in our own actions to attain that. When Jesus came through, he fulfilled that ultimate promise, fulfilled that law. And while the eternal debt to the law has been fulfilled, the burden was taken away from us. Uh, while this may be easier for us to understand today, this is a radical idea for the Jew Jewish people. And while this debt was still to be paid, the law is not done just yet. Do we throw aside the law? No. What do we do with it? Well, Paul says this in verse 8, Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. We have a responsibility to fulfill the law with each other. Yet God has fulfilled our covenant with him. The law was not only given to be a right relationship with God, but it was a right relationship with all of those around us. We have an obligation to those we come in contact with. And this obligation, Paul takes right out of the words of Jesus when asked the most important commandment of the law. In Matthew twenty two thirty seven, 37, it says, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. You see, Paul, Jesus and Paul call us to something deeper. While the Pharisees were trying to memorize the letter of the law, Jesus was getting right to the heart of the law. Jesus says, while the law says do not ma murder, I say do not be angry. While the law says do not commit adultery, I say do not lust. His entire Sermon on the Mount is this mind transformation that takes place. Of instead of the actions that occur, what about the heart? Where are we actually with our heart posture towards this law? When there's a selfless and submissive love to our neighbor, there is no room in our heart for coveting. There is no room in our heart for hatred or jealousy because of the continual transformation happening within because of the mercy of God. To love is to fill the continual debt to one another. Because when we are serving one another in love, we are really serving our Father. It is not this checklist that needs to be done to make sure I, I, I go be with the widows or I, I feed the orphans. It is, is, a, is a heart transformation that happens because of the mercy that has been given through us. It is this way of looking at the world with a kingdom focus. The same way that we submit to government authorities, we submit to each other in love. That is our biggest calling. The law is, is beautiful and is, is good. But when we get to the heart of it, 
how are we being transformed daily? And this is not an easy thing to do. I understand that. It requires daily transformation of our minds. That is why we need to be in the word of God daily. It's why we need to be in communion daily. It's why we need to be spurring each other on in good works. We talked about the body of Christ and it's beautiful how everyone has different talents, different gifts to be given. And we need to show and spur each other on in this love. It is not easy, I understand. But we are called to a higher way of living. We're ha- called to a higher way of loving our community. Can you imagine if the church was a group that was just known for loving everyone despite their differences, despite what was happening in their lives? Imagine how that would transform the world. Instead of being a group that says what we deserve, our rights, we say, okay, our rights, yeah, absolutely, but we have Jesus. We have the ultimate hope. And we want to go love and serve our community. Our submission to others in love is a form of worship to our God. And finally, Paul talks about uh, the coming day. And this is a, a, a weird area to kind of talk about. So I'm going to try my, my best to kind of hit this. But um, I have this joke um, with some friends at work where uh, if you saw something online and are too embarrassed to say you saw it on TikTok or Instagram Reels, um, you say you read an article about it. So uh, <laughs> I read an article recently this week. Uh, it was about Black Friday, and it had this audio clip in it. Uh, <laughs> where it has this adult and it has this little kid and it has this kind of sign where it's like, wait for it, wait for it, keep waiting, go, go, run, keep going, go, go, don't look back, keep going, go, go, go. And it's hilarious how God can shape your view when you have your mind set on him. But when I saw this, I I saw this beautiful correlation between Israel and the church. It's for thousands of years. You see, uh, Israel was waiting for their Messiah. They were waiting for the one who would come stomp the head on the serpent and free them. And what happened with Israel, or, 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 or some part of it, is that when that Savior came, they didn't want to move. They didn't want to actually put the rubber to the road. In fact, they didn't want to move so badly, they went and crucified that one person who was trying to set them free. And is this urgency that Paul is talking about when the day of the coming of the Lord? There is no more waiting. There is no more uh, stalling time. We are called into a new transformed life because of Jesus' death on the cross. Verse 11 says this, The hour has come for you to wake from your slumber because our salvation is near now than when we first believed. He calls us to run the race with perseverance and endurance because our days are numbered. No, we do not know when Christ will return, but we do know he will return one day. He has come and he will come again. But in the meantime, we are called to a higher way of living. Paul makes his clearest day. We are not in a time of waiting, but in a time where we daily clothe ourselves in the character of Jesus Christ, spreading the gospel to everyone who will listen. We are called to wake up from our slumber daily and live the life that he has called us to. You see, Paul uses this strong imagery of light and darkness, and honestly, this war imagery. It says in verse 12, the night is nearly over, the day is almost here, so let us put aside the deeds of the darkness and put on the armor of light. You can just hear Paul crying out to the church, don't you get it? There is urgency. There is the, the time, we do not know when it will happen. But we are called into movement. We are called into action. All of this is more important than that Christmas party that you could host. It is more important than paying your taxes or squabbling on eating kosher, which he talks about in the next chapter. We are at war here. This is a call to arms. And we don't know when this battle is going to end, but we need to be united in love. Loving the church body, loving our community, loving our government, loving our enemies. That is how we're supposed to live. Not in this bravo of what can the world do for me? What can the church do for me? What can the government do for me? But how can I submit in love in spite of what has been done for me on the cross? 
How can I live in submission to those around me so that I can live out a life that Jesus lived? Because Jesus lived the most beautiful life of complete submission. He had all authority. We sang about it, all authority, all power. And yet he came down as a humble servant to submit and serve his people. Church, our world needs us. Our world needs us to love like Jesus. That is what Paul is saying. Clothe yourselves in Jesus Christ. Clothe himself in your character, in his obedience, in his humility. Clothe yourselves in him because our world needs Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. We need to move in the name of Jesus. There is no ifs, ands, or buts. And this is this rallying call that Paul is calling us to. Because of those first 11 chapters, because of that first area where he's explaining the gospel, because of that mercy, in view of that mercy that was given, we are called into right relationship with all those around us, whether it be in our church body, our community, our enemies, our government, the law. There is urgency to what we need to do. We are called to submit to others as a form of worship to our God. We need to make a decision. If we believe this gospel that has been laid out for us week after week, we need to be spurred into something greater. Um, I, worship team, if you wouldn't mind coming up. Um, we're we're going to move into one of perhaps the, the oldest traditions of the church, and that is communion. Um, it's this beautiful reminder of what God is. So if, if 